Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovix. Joining me today is Matthew Pippenberg, the Commercial Director of Matterhorn Asset Management and also the author of Gold Matters and Rig to Fail. Matt, how are you today? I'm good, Tom. It's good to be back. Looking forward to this. Me too. It's always always great to have you on. And you know, you you just returned from a trip to the States. We were kind of discussing that before we hit record here today. Yeah. And one of the themes I would say that that you expressed to me that seems to be a lot of people are worried about is the idea of centralization. And I mean, that can take any number of forms here and and is taking a number of forms in the US and, and in the world generally. So why don't we start there and, and talk a little bit about what you saw and, and what struck you because it's been a little bit since you've been in the US, right? Yeah, it's been almost a year. And it was interesting to start in Washington, D.C. and end up in Palm Beach, you know, and then stop in Atlanta and Charleston and talk to the rich, the poor, the left, the right, you know, the black, the white, the gas station attendant to the billionaire at the conference and and, and to see different shades of America. And, and you know, it, it was kind of surreal um, in a lot of ways. And I, you know, look, I've been writing for years and speaking for years soberly with a little bit of sarcasm about the centralization or the death of capitalism. You know, it really began in 1910 down in Jekyll Island, which I passed on my way down to, to Florida when the Fed put the first bullet into the heart of capitalism. It's been a slow bleed ever since. But, you know, I think about the monetization of our debt with mouse click money, which is a complete eradication of, you know, free price discovery and natural supply and demand. When you look at you know, the Fed absorbing toxic MBS bonds and probably pretty soon will be absorbing CRE bonds on, you know, commercial real estate bonds on its balance sheet. Look at Congress bailing out banks that put us in the crisis of 2008. When you look at the centralization of Geithner and and, and, and former Goldman Sachs CIOs making decisions for the, for the taxpayers, when you look at the CFTC turning a blind eye on the open price fixing in the metals market, you know, again, capitalism, kind of seems to be dying through centralization and central bank digital currency, which I'm sure we'll talk about. It's just another symptom of that. And the Fed now slow drip Trojan horse towards CBDC. Um, you know, and I, and I thought a lot about, you know, even, you know, even the, even the collapse of regional banks, which are slowly making headlines again, you know, Heartbrand was a small one, but this slow move towards larger kind of consolidation of the banking industry, where eventually the big commercial banks will just be branch offices of the Fed if central bank digital currency has its way. To me, again, all these things kind of coalesce to make it very clear that capitalism died a long time ago. And, and it died by centralization. The last time you saw a central bank with that much power was the Soviet Union. And that's not a sensational thing to think about. We're not there yet, but we're slow dripping there. And certainly, when you look at the, the fact that 90% of the inflated assets came that came since the great financial crisis benefited the top 10% of the country. So we have feudalism with a few counts, V counts, dukes, and lords and the middle class, which is getting crushed by current federal, central bank policy. So to me, it's a very centralized, dead capitalist society, quantifiably. But what I kind of took away from thinking about America when I was there, too, with all the debates, it's a pre-election year, a lot of sensationalism. But I think even democracy is dying by centralization in a strange way. And that again, that sounds kind of hype, but you know, we've got this weaponized media system it's corporate owned there's no deni- there's no denying that the legacy media has lost the full faith and credit of the uh, or trust of the american people again left or right we've got a weaponization of the department of justice i studied law in undergrad and in law school and there is always politicization of the law or of this legal system but what we're seeing now uh is extraordinary again left or right and i'm certainly as we talked about no particular fan of trump and certainly no particular fan of biden but to see the the pathetic, thin nature of these indictments when in a political year, you can't help but wonder, is it an abuse of, of, of our quote unquote blind legal system? Again, I don't want to get into partisan debates, but that seems like a weaponization of an agency. You now, John Whitehead had a, an interesting interview of maybe a month or two back about the literal weaponization of our federal agencies. I'm not talking about the CIA or the FBI. There's 1.6 billion hollow point bullets, and that includes the Department of Education, the Department of Agriculture, Amtrak. The post office. I mean, we seem to be a police state. This is it's this kind of crazy centralized kind of 
weaponization of, of everything. And even, of course, science was politicized again, not going to get a debate about COVID, but the lockdowns are starting to have a ripple effect now in the U.S. People are, are questioning and scratching their heads. You had the great Barrington Accords in 2020 when this was all started out. You had hundreds of experts from Oxford and Stanford and Harvard who were virologists and doctors who had a different opinion than one person. And that didn't seem to matter. So there was an eradication of open debate in the media and this corporatized media. Uh, that's appalling for a free society. And again, I, I don't want to sound sensational. I, I'm trying to be as as, as, as as balanced as I can. But we, as, we, as we talked about before this, Mussolini's definition of fascism, not democracy, is the perfect marriage of government and corporations. That's almost like a Davos-like dystopia. But that is happening in America, the land of the free. And the word deep state is no longer funny. It's, it's a term of art in America. And you had Bob Moriarty on, you know, recently. I thought it was brilliant. He happens to live near me in France now. He's a former Vietnam vet, fighter pilot, a bird dog pilot. Obviously, he probably did some intel work in Vietnam. And he made a statement that literally what the official narrative is, is almost 180 degrees opposite of what really is going on. I don't think that's sensational anymore. I don't think that's left or right, rich or poor. Um, there's a lot of fractured in American society, but we're seeing a centralized democracy and a centralized capitalism, which means we don't have real democracy or real capitalism. And I think all of that kind of cynicism, there's evidence of that in the bond markets, there's evidence of that in currency markets, there's evidence of that in the, in the commodity markets, there's evidence of that in the debt markets and in the precious metal markets. So it's not meant to be scary or political. I think it's a sober analysis that many Americans and even here in Europe and Canadians would, would agree with. Certainly Canadians have experienced this. So I think that's just something we should be cautious of. And um, I don't think it needs to result in pitchforks, but I think we need we can do better. But I think we have to have our eyes more open about centralization. Uh, we literally have a central bank. The name speaks for itself. But the power of the central bank and the power of our government um, to weaponize Everything from the media, the justice system to information, uh, to me, is disconcerting. It's disturbing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. I was recently listening to an interview where it was a, it was an author of the book that was being interviewed, and he was he was saying that when when this critical mass of people wakes up to this idea that you know most of what we've been told over the last couple of years is all just fabricated. We don't necessarily, to your point, need to bring out the pitchforks. It can be a peaceful just no. And I yep. think I think a a great example of that could be, you know, if we get to that point, this introduction of a CBDC, most people understand that this is going to be ultimately used as a, a lever of control or has the potential for that even. That hopefully is is a great way to start to, you know, resist some system like that. But Matt, you know, you, you brought up the point of these, these other two small banks that failed, I think, at the tail end of last week there. Do you think that that is how we kind of get to another CBDC moment or the introduction of a CBDC? Well, look, even the BIS has already kind of said they'd like to have the central banks going towards a CBDC currency by 2025, all the Western banks. Good luck getting, you know, the other Eastern banks in law, but we'll see. You know, and the IMF and the BIS and even the Fed within the last three years have been anchoring and telegraphing the need for this CBDC, or at least the Fed now, which is chapter one of what will eventually, in my opinion, uh, slow drip in. I mean, this is the common tool of of Intel systems throughout the world, throughout history. You start with the anchoring and then you slowly wait for it. And then you create a crisis or you take advantage of a crisis to implement it. Uh, the slow drip telegraphing of Fed now as a faster payment system, as a more efficient payment system than say the Fed wire, which already exists, they can do billions more in transactions and track them better in the name of a more efficient payment system, uh, ignoring uh, the obvious privacy rights issues and control issues. It is very Orwellian and dystopian when you think about the real motive behind CBDC. Um, I think like Rick Rule, it's horrifying. And, and I think to your point, whether it's on platforms like yours or whether it's Russell Brand or Tucker Carlson, the fact that there's an alternative media, which is getting far more attention than the legacy media because it's more authentic, you may not always agree with it because there's some real crazy on the alternative media. 
But people are pretty good at discerning what makes sense to them. And, you know, it's, it's platforms like this and, and folks like Rick Rule or Jim Rickards or others or George Gammon really doing a fantastic job of kind of slow dripping out to the rest of the world the dangers here. I don't think the control state uh, 60, 50, 20, or even 10 years ago anticipated this type of, at least for now, free information. So more and more people are going to have an eyebrow raised if they try to do CBDC. Nevertheless, we just saw in the COVID crisis how you could take an entire world and shut it down with the right messaging. This goes back to the Kissinger point. If you control money, you control the world. If you control money and information, then you really have control. If you control the narrative and you control the financing, that's power. But what's also power is this bottom-up movement to be informed. You know, it doesn't have to be agreeing with me or you or every every guest you have. But most of us, regardless of our bull or bear views, or our precious metal views, or our inflation deflation views, or our recession or no recession views, we all see similar forces aligning, and it's it's not good. And we're all making warnings. And I think more and more citizens who aren't with MBAs or work on Wall Street or, or trade precious metals or look at a Bloomberg screen are getting more informed. I think that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And I do think, however, though, that the power of government and the power of information is still strong, stronger than us for now. I do worry that when we have a massive credit event, there's so many needles pointing at the debt bubbles in, in Europe and the US, and, and we can talk about those. Um, like when you have a massive viral event or a flu, uh, you know, um, you can control a lot with the message. And I worry that if there's a massive credit event, that the, the central bank digital currency will be will be Trojan horse to the public as, look, we're going to protect you. We're a bank that cannot fail, unlike these regional banks, unlike these silly smaller banks, who, by the way, died because of the Fed policy to raise rates and kill their collateral. But that, they won't be they won't talk about that. They'll blame it on mismanagement of balance sheets. They'll blame it on weaker, smaller banks. Wouldn't it be safer to get better interest rates at the Fed? Wouldn't it be safer to not have to worry about FDIC insurance? Wouldn't it be safer that we have your back? Oh, we won't talk about that we're going cashless and we won't talk about that we'll be surveying you. Not now. That may happen 10 years from now. But for right now, we're going to save you. That's what I worry about, how they control the narrative. And if we can keep a sane threading of that needle, hopefully there'll be resistance to that. Uh, hopefully constructive resistance rather than just anarchy. Um, because, look, we are in too much debt. Things are going to break. They have been breaking. It's not even predicting anymore. There's been years of things breaking. Sadly, right now, with with the raising rate environment and the, the the rise in delinquencies on credit cards and auto loans and small businesses, I mean, massive amounts of layoffs, massive raise rise in bankruptcies right now. That's the middle class businesses. They can't get better terms. They can't get Apple like or Microsoft terms. And it's always the middle class that gets hit in a recession. It's always the middle class that gets drafted in a war. It's always the middle class who's four hundred one k tanks. And uh, that's not that again, that's not that's centralization. That's feudalism. That's not normal capitalism. And I think as that middle class gets more informed, hopefully they'll vote better or react better to things like CBDC, which I think is a very dangerous force. It's so it's one among so many. Mm -hmm. But the very fact that even Apple has a three trillion dollar market cap, again, that's not in tune with antitrust laws. That's not in tune with natural capitalism. That is an aberration. That's not successful capitalism. That's that's something else. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, the kind of where my mind went to when you when you brought up that idea of, of centralization in anywhere we look, that centralization also exists within the markets. You know, if we look at the Nasdaq, that that concentration of growth and wealth between, let's say, the top five stocks, you know, you, you brought up the S&P. 500. Well, it should be the S&P 5, as you were saying. So, you know, the 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 danger that that ends up kind of highlighting to yeah. anybody that is sober enough to be able to step back and, and try to understand that yeah. really is just another symptom of this this kind of, as you said, this this looming bubble with a thousand needles pointed at. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I won't I won't name the name, but I remember a few years ago I was in New York with a very powerful member of the cabinet at a party who maybe had one too many drinks. And we were talking about, you know, central bank policy. It's crazy. It's not sustainable, blah, blah, blah. And uh, I remember him looking at me in the eye and say, we don't have to be right. We're on the inside. I'll never forget that. <laughs> and I'll never forget that. It How reminds revealing. me of, I won't say who it is. He, yeah. he, he has a lot of sins in his past financially, in my opinion, yet he's got a lot of power. And I know a lot of these guys I went to school with and a couple gals, too, who are in the young leadership program at Davos. And again, 
this is a bias, but the folks I know who are part of that Davos dystopia, in my view, uh, which is supposedly an altruistic new vision for society, and this again is a personal opinion, it's a bias, mm-hmm. won't name names, but they were not, and they are still not, thinking about society. These people were very ambitious, like the Sam Maltmans of the world. And he wasn't a friend of mine. I'm just saying, but this world coin and this stuff, it's crazy if you dig under the hood of it. But the folks I know who went to Davos and drank that Kool-Aid, they're not thinking about making the world a better place. They're thinking about making their network a better place. And that's the truth. In my opinion, from what I've seen, that's the truth as I see it. They're not the best and the brightest. They're not the Robert Kennedys or the DeSantis's or even the Vida Yamasamas, you know, these people are bright, but they actually seem to be authentic. They're not even the Russell brands. They actually, these guys, Russell and Tucker, they seem to actually care about the world. And they're from totally different political views. Mm-hmm. I, I see hope in that. I hope we can unmask the hypocrisy and the self-interest of groups like Davos, or even groups like the central banks or the Federal Reserve, or frankly, the cabinet you know, or the board members at Microsoft or Apple, which are too big. They're literally too big. And our commercial banks. Again, I worked on Wall Street. I did very well on Wall Street by luck. The salaries I saw at Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley or JP Morgan or UBS or Barclays and the friends I went to school with or grad school with, nothing they did warranted those kind of salaries. And it does bother me a lot. And I'm not trying to become political. It does bother me a lot that there's that disparity in salaries between hardworking normies, families in the Midwest who are you know, busting their butts to get through tax season. And what these people can make for really not bringing much good to the world. If you walk into a room with perfume, you're going to get the perfume on you. You're going to smell good. When there's that much money in a system, if you get the job and put your head down, you're going to make a lot. It doesn't mean you actually deserve it. And that's why I say when I see the NASDAQ or the S&P or the Dow post-2008 go up in that massive level and see the vast majority of that money going to one small minority of the population, that, again, is not healthy capitalism. That's something else. That's feudalism. And feudalism is centralized and it's controlling. And again, that goes back to my theme. It's so distorted. What we just saw in the silver market on the, on, uh, on the COMEX, it was a drive-by shooting. Again, you know, you had a technical formation, a wedge formation. It was clearly silver was about to break out. And then uh, overnight, you see this massive sale by B of A and other big commercial banks with open interest positions. In other words, there's no actual metal behind the sale. There's no collateral. They're just using the power of their membership in that comics to short the hell out of silver. Why? Because silver and gold are terrifying to the system. Because if they rise too fast, that makes the dollar look as embarrassed as it should be. A dollar, which we can talk about, is slowly, not overnight, (laughs) de-dollarizing. If you embarrass the dollar when the dollar is already weaponized and embarrassed, that's a threat to those, quote unquote, centralized planners, this Politburo that we have now in D.C. and in Wall Street. Again, I'm as capitalist as they come. I'm as patriotic as they come. I love America. I grew up playing baseball. I don't recognize it. And I see the anger and the frustration on the main streets from Charleston to Palm Beach, totally different worlds to D.C. The average citizen, even the insider citizen is like, this isn't right. Something really wrong here. And that's why folks like RFK and Russell Brand and, and, and DeSantis, left or right, are getting more attention because I think they're at least considered more authentic, hopefully. And, and and willing to point out some of the problems and issues that they see and very likely where those problems originated. Yeah. And, you yeah. know, it's, it's interesting to me, again, kind of going back to something I was reading here last week. And as you're, as you're talking there, it made me think about the point that was brought up in this book that we have really by this hyper financialization kind of move that has gone on over the last 40 years, this has created a, a distortion not only in the financial markets, but also, let's say, the labor markets. You know, this has created, as you said, somebody at Goldman's salary shouldn't be justified for what they're actually doing, what 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 their what productive capacity they're bringing to society. And that was the point that was made with the advance of cheap money or this distortion is that it also has this ripple effect within the labor market where you have all kinds of people that aren't necessarily, you know, creating better forms of generating energy, creating, you know, better ways of farming, anything like that. 
we're so focused on the financial markets and that isn't necessarily you know a net positive for the progress of society no i was i was thinking about altman and his world coin again another davos young leader another mm-hmm. bilderberg type but again you know we all have our little clubs but you know you talk about you know, something heartbreaking about when you go to a grocery store and there's some kind person trying to help you through the automatic line because they're no longer using human beings. Mm-hmm. So she's helping make herself obsolete. She's trying to teach you how to use, or he's trying to teach you how to use the self-checkout so that eventually they won't need people like him or her anymore to do it for you. Just like you don't need a bank teller. You go to an ATM. They're making themselves obsolete and they're helping themselves. Well, Altman has this WorldCoin idea and he's, of course, with the Davos, you know, I'm doing this for you, the community. He's made millions in AI which is the new hype. Millions in AI, but you know, AI is so good for us. I think it's a sci-fi dystopia. And I think there are executives at Google, you know, who would agree, but it's, he creates this dystopia. He knows it's going to lead to technological layoffs of labor to your point. And his solution is to come up with this world coin where this is like, again, it's like out of a bad movie from the circa 1990s with Schwarzenegger, some modern horror film where you put your eyes into this silver ball and it gives you UBI through some new world coin. We're going to need universal basic income for you serfs, you slaves, because my artificial intelligence is going to make you obsolete. I'm going to make money on the AI, but I'm going to help you with my new world coin. Mm -hmm. That's the type of thinking we have. It's so self-interested. It's so centralized. It's the lords coming up with their great ideas to make humanity better through AI. Artificial intelligence, by the way, is an oxymoron. If it's artificial, it's not really intelligent. But yes, it's certainly faster than than us. But I'm saying his solution, and, and George Gammon was brilliant. He said, well, that's like the arsonist being the fireman, you know? It's the arsonist. He, he burns all these labor, and then he creates an opportunity to make more money and then create a, a class of citizens who are uninformed, who think universal basic income can help them. And, and I'm hoping that's not good enough for most people. I hope they want to have a chance, a fair shot at fair capitalism, which allows for open competition, not unique rights to lower rates or easier money or better terms or completely distorted salaries. Uh, the, 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 the executive to, to labor uh, salary ratio has gone off the charts. It's beyond moral. Um, again, this isn't communist. This isn't socialist. This is capitalist. You can do it right. But what we're doing now is uh, uh, it's, it's reaching a tipping point, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think, unfortunately, if you, if you force a lot of people into that, that kind of corner where they are just barely keeping up with their bills. They are constantly playing catch up with inflation and debt and higher rates everywhere they turn. I think it's going to be easy to offer UBI as a solution to a lot of people that feel really stuck. And as, as much as we can try and help inform people about it, it could end up being that type of situation that yeah. ends up, let's say, setting the hook for a lot of those people. Yeah. yeah. Matt, you mentioned earlier that you know we're going into an election year here. How do you think that ends up really affecting Fed policy in a way? You know, the, the Fed is not supposed to be political in any way, yet we know it's it is. So how does that start to act as a as a headwind and or a tailwind coming into election year? Yeah, it's normally a very good question. Typically, election years are good for the markets. A pre-election year is usually not necessarily a melt-up. It's usually very, uh, it's very conducive to being supportive of the markets, which would mean rate hikes probably wouldn't be that supportive. You'd want to Certainly, I'm sure whoever's running, certainly on the, on the left, and Biden in particular is going to talk about beating inflation uh, and, and kind of put that feather in their cap. Um, but I think what's happening, the Fed's power or D.C.'s power to manipulate markets and manipulate outcomes is getting weaker and weaker because I think the Fed is losing control of rates and losing control of inflation. There's this notion that now we're at 3% CPI, which, again, is an open fiction. But even if you assume, because, again, the Bureau of Labor Statistics is statistics, which comes up with our CPI data, is never honest, but it's always right because it's official. But even if you take 3% CPI, um, target 2% inflation, uh, as Luke Roman says, is a lack of second derivative thinking. It's um, Powell, I think, is going to create more inflation 
by fighting inflation, uh, at least allegedly fighting inflation. I think he he wants negative real rates and he wants inflation to inflate away debt. He just lies about the CPI scale. But this is something a white paper came out uh, from the June St. Louis Fed in June. St. Louis Fed came out of the white paper, called it fiscal dominance. And it's something that Lou Groman's done a lot better job than me explaining in detail. But in simple terms, what fiscal dominance means is by fighting inflation through raising rates, this Volcker task to hit target 2% at any cost and breaking all kinds of things along the way from banks to bond markets to middle class incomes. Um, but by seeking target 2% inflation, uh, he's had to raise rates, which makes the cost of debt higher, which makes the cost of Uncle Sam's bar tab higher. So the irony is he'll get to 2% inflation. But then the, the interest expense on Uncle Sam's bar tab, the U.S. Treasury, becomes infinitely higher, which means that eventually he's going to have to manufacture more money, mouse click more money, to pay for that increased interest expense, which, by the way, the U.S. Treasury just got a downgrade. We can talk about the Fitch downgrade. It's all tied together. America's never going to default because they can mouse click money, but they just got a downgrade. So we're hitting this point where fighting inflation will actually create inflation. The fact that we're at 3%, which again is a bogus number, the fact that we've come from 9% in September last year to 3% this year in inflation is hardly a victory lap. And it's hardly the end of the inflation narrative. It's just a pause in the cycle. And we're going to see much higher, higher inflation as the Fed loses control of the markets and of interest rates, because ultimately the bond market, no matter how distorted it is, gets the last say in, in, in this. But you know, by fighting inflation at any cost, that target 2%, I say it's like you've got a rash on your thumb, so you cut off your whole hand. That's what Powell's policy is essentially doing. I joked at the uh, at the rules symposium in my presentation, it's kind of like Napoleon's army. Napoleon had to get to Moscow. And, 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 Volker, and excuse me, Powell has to get 2% inflation. So Napoleon marched into Moscow or into Russia with 422,000 soldiers, and he limped out with 10,000 for a various number of reasons. It was a disaster, but he did officially get Moscow. And I'm, I'm saying that I think Powell can maybe get 2% target CPI, but he's going to limp out like Napoleon's army. And there's going to be such a carnage, a train wreck in his wake that there already has begun with the treasury market, the sell-off in U.S. treasuries, the central bank sell-off, the net sell-off, the, the stacking of gold, the loss of faith in Uncle Sam's IOUs, the failure of smaller banks, the pressure on the middle class in the U.S. He's already broken so many things. I think there are more bigger events to happen. But effectively, you know, he may get target 2% inflation and lie about it for about 10 minutes, but the inflationary inevitability and the disconnect, to your point, how the politicians won't be able to narrate this. When, when you look at the math of our deficit, how, how high our deficits are, and how few foreigners are holding our IOUs anymore, that spread is right where it was right during the COVID crisis. And during the COVID crisis, to fill that gap, we had to print, print trillions of dollars. That's an embarrassing little statistic or fact that most experts don't want to talk about. Um, but you know the the danger is real, and um, and I don't think the Fed has any solution. We don't know this week or next week, but there's going to be no solution other than to inflate the currency, debase the currency, to pay for our debts. And uh, the same thing is going to happen at the ECB and at the Bank of Japan. And I think the big credit event, the big credit event that no one's talking about, just like no one's talking about the oil market and the BRICS de-dollarization story. The real story isn't the BRICS; it's Saudi Arabia. But the real problem in the credit market isn't even Powell right now. If Japan raises rates, there's a massive carry trade right now with U.S. hedge funds and money market managers and investors and in, in, in you know dark you know shadow banking, where they're basically borrowing from Japan at low rates to lever in U.S. markets. But if Japan has to raise rates because it's you know going to be fighting inflation to buy oil with, with the based yen. It may or may not happen, but if Japan raises rates, that's going to unwind that carry trade. There's going to be a massive margin call in the bond markets. And again, that's just, I want to get into the details of that. That's just one example of many that could happen that we can't foresee. What usually creates a trigger event or a sell off in the bond markets, which is, which is everything, is something we don't see coming or isn't talked about in the headlines. Everyone's talking about the BRICS and de dollarization. And God knows I can talk about that too because I'm not a fan of the US dollar. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's going to happen this month, the end of the dollar or some new gold backed trading currency. But there's so many other risks that we don't need to hype up that are very real, whether it's the Japanese central bank or Saudi Arabian oil policy, there are bigger threats. Um, but again, I don't think the Fed can control that just like they did in an election year to get to your question. 
these problems in the credit markets and the inflationary consequences of them, it'll be interesting if they can time that, if they can control that. You know, the Fed is and the dollar is like the Wehrmacht or Napoleon's army. It's hard to kill. It doesn't happen overnight. They have a lot of power. But the end result is going to be the same. It's just a question of when, not if. You know, just like the Germans couldn't win a two front war and Napoleon couldn't fight everyone. Powell can't save the dollar forever. That's not going to happen. And we can't prevent inflation forever. And I think investors maybe are impatient or certainly gold investors are impatient. But if they're bought gold for the right reasons, they're not worried. They're just protecting their purchasing power. But um, we're really in surreal times right now. Uh, not tomorrow, not the next day, right now. It's no longer predicting. It's, 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 it's occurring right now. Yeah. Matt, I'd, I'd like to go into a bit more detail, if you wouldn't mind, on that Japanese, the Japanese yen carry trade. Because we did, somebody had pointed it out on Twitter the other day as something they wanted to understand a little bit more about and the risks of such an event. So if you wouldn't mind, can we, can we dive into yeah, a sure. more of those details? Yeah, it's, it's, you know, you know, going back in history, I mean, Japan needs oil. It needs oil. In fact, you could argue that one of the reasons they had to preemptive strike Pearl Harbor was they wanted to get the Pacific fleet out of the way so they could go protect their oil interests. But um, Japan is a major importer of oil and they're going to need to buy. And, it, and I think the price of oil, which has reverted to its medium price range and now spiking back up, is going to rise, which, by the way, will affect inflation. But if the price of oil rises. Japan needs oil. It's got to do a couple of things. First, it'll probably have to sell off some of its U.S. treasuries. Again, that'll put more pressure on the U.S. and in the U.S. Treasury and inflation. But um, it will have to sell off some trade, but it'll probably have to create more yen, which is what the Japanese do better than everyone. I mean, they've been they've been quantitative easing since you know they wrote the playbook. Bernanke gave it to them, but they they began QE long before we did. They've got a major debt to GDP problem. They've got other things that America, other advantages over America that we don't. But their bottom line is, I think they're going to have to um, create more more yen, which. The Bank of Japan has already kind of signaled, toe dip, that they're going to look relook at the yield curve, which basically is a way of saying they may raise rates to stave off inflation. Uh, an entire generation of Japanese haven't really suffered inflation. Um, but now um, they're going, to, I think, because of oil prices and because of energy needs, there's a real threat now after so many years of massive amounts of debt and so many years of QE that the inflation is starting to toe dip out of, you know, stick its head out of the sand. And so if they have to raise rates, even a small amount, even 50 basis points, 25 basis points, the amount of leverage in the U.S. on the yen, not on the euro, not on the kroner, not on the ruble, not on the yuan, on the yen, because it's been the, the best, it's been the cheapest credit you can get. And, and leverage is all about credit. And, and Wall Street is all about credit. So if you could go to J Japanese institutions, borrow the yen, arbitrage the currency to then invest in U.S. or other markets or derivatives or options and use massive terms of leverage with that yen base, um, you can create nice margins and, and, and hopefully unwind your position safely. But if in the middle of that leverage, the, B the Bank of Japan announces an overnight rate hike or uh, uh, then even 25 basis points when it's levered 100 to 1, <laughs> creates a credit event. And a credit event creates a liquidity event. And every crisis in the markets is always a liquidity crisis. I'm not saying it's going to happen. It's an example of the kind of things that could happen. And whether it starts in Japan or some other trading desk, you know, the butterfly effect, we saw what happened when long-term capital management underestimated the ruble, or we saw what happened when one hedge fund went down, um, what that can do. But if a central bank like Japan, which no one's really looking at, um, makes a change. Or if there's an overnight headline out of Saudi Arabia about oil sales, oil sales outside the dollar, that's a massive event on the currency markets and the rate markets. I'm just saying that no one, including me in particular, has any clue or any crystal ball of what specific trigger there is. But when you have 95 trillion in combined public household and in, in, in corporate debt in America, and it's run on leverage, and you have a derivative market that's run on 200, 100 times leverage, and any significant credit event comes in there to shake that very, very fragile glass, it falls off the counter and breaks. Mm -hmm. That's not sensationalism. Again, we don't need to be sensational, as we talked about before this call. There's all these headlines and clickbait about the end of the dollar with the BRICS trading currency. We can talk about that too. We don't need hype because there's already so much that's sensational in our reality right now in this misunderstood credit market. But there's just too much debt and not enough liquidity. 
and and in the dollar and the euro dollar it's all tied up and tied up and clogged up in these derivative markets so people don't realize there's a constant need for liquidity and a japanese rate hike would make it even less liquid in an already thirsty market it would create a shock in the credit system and banking is about credit it's not about money it's about credit so bonds matter credits matter rate hikes matter they're boring they're interconnected but it's just another symptom of a, of a system that's way over its top and um up here's my cat way over its top and uh i think very fragile um i hope that answers the question tom but i mean it it, it is it is one of many needles pointed at this balloon you know matt it makes me wonder really if the high rates in the u.s and in in a lot of ways this this weaponization of the reserve currency you know there there's kind of two Two separate pieces to that, obviously, is the the interest rate and higher interest rate for for longer side of the equation. And then there's the other side of it, of, of the dollar being really used as a weapon in the example of taking Russia's reserves away from them at the beginning of the conflict. So does that does that start to let's just take the the rate hiking and and quantitative tightening side of the equation for now does that end up creating all these other situations as as downstream effects as as second order effects when we are in this this 40 year cycle of interest rates just going nowhere but down a number of questions there to answer them in sex sections i don't think the weaponization and the sanctions is a separate issue from Fed policy, although they are connected. It certainly was a political decision at the White House, not a Fed decision at the Eccles building, what the, the, the absurdly stupid idea of weaponizing the dollar. But I wrote an article a few weeks ago, um, you know, Powell, angel or devil, basically. And I spent a lot of years in, in, in ink making fun of Powell. One thing you can say to Powell's credit, in all fairness, is he's the first central banker in, in a long line of central bankers, certainly since Greenspan. It really, you have to go back to Volcker and, and, and Ted Martin, or uh, excuse me, William Martin, um, to see a central banker trying to take away Wall Street's punch bowl. You know, I, I've I've spent a lot of um, ink and time and hours uh, making fun of Powell, but I, I will say one thing good about Powell, and I wrote about this recently, is he is one of the first central bankers, um, really since you know, Ted Martin or Paul Volcker uh, to take the punch bowl away from Wall Street, to actually tighten, increase the cost of debt, to take some of that leverage out of the system, to quote unquote, threaten the stock market, to not be a, a rich uncle to spoiled nephews on Wall Street. So by tightening, that supposedly takes some of the tailwinds out of the markets. And by reducing the balance sheet, that I think is in some ways many positive things. I think the reason Powell is doing that isn't just because he's anti Wall Street. Nobody in the Fed is anti Wall Street. They they they're owned by Wall Street or they bow to each other. But but Powell knows a recession is coming. And so I think he's raising rates now and trying to reduce barely the balance sheet so that he'll have something to cut and to expand when this recession that everyone pretends isn't going to happen mm -hmm. does come. Even Powell has admitted that there's a very narrow chance um, of a soft landing. So he is almost engineering a recession to fight this inflationary pain. So, in some ways, the you know to your question, this this higher for longer will continue until I think the S and P really does take a nosedive. That will be the market indicator that will then cause, as it has throughout central bank history in the U.S., when the markets really take a gut punch. That's when we pivot. That's when we start tightening. I mean, excuse me, easing, and that's when we start expanding the balance sheet. Powell tried that throughout 2018, and then it went to hell at the very end of the year, and he had to pivot and then print. And when we had unlimited QE, I think it's a very similar trajectory now. He is forward telegraphing these rate hikes. He'll keep raising so that he'll have something to cut when we really need it. Because if we had a major recession two years ago with rates already at the floor and the balance sheet already fat, he'd have no tools left. He's simply rearming himself with the only two weapons he has. He has one gun that's rate hikes or rate cuts, and the other gun that's a thin or expanding or contracting balance sheet. That's all he has. So he's prepping for a recession. As to the weaponization of the U.S. dollar um, and freezing Russia's FX reserves, in a sense, by the way, that is a technical default on a bond. When you freeze an FX reserve, you're defaulting on payment of that bond. 
But that, I think, is a separate issue. Um, that's a more global issue. It backfired on the decision makers, though, because what they thought they were doing when they weaponized the dollar was reminding the world of the power of the, of the, of the world reserve currency, the power of the U.S. government, the power of U.S. policy to make mincemeat out of Putin and a ruble and his economy. And the exact opposite has happened. What has happened is the, the rest of the world, not just Russia and China, are sick of the, the U.S. dollar tail wagging the global dog. When you weaponize that dollar, you increase the distrust of that dollar. John Maynard Keynes warned against weaponizing a, a, a world reserve currency. Barack Obama warned against weaponizing the world reserve currency. Robert Triffin, an economist, came in front of Congress in the 1960s and warned against weaponizing a world reserve currency because it creates distrust. Mm-hmm. And, and you already had a dollar that was too strong for the vast majority of the emerging markets and the developing economies, because the MO for the US was always to export its inflation. You have banana republics that when interest rates are low, they start to borrow. Then the US jacks up rates. Those countries can't afford those rates. Then they have to inflate or debase their own currency, and they're caught in a debt trap. They become dependent on the US and the US dollar, just like you know, it's a form of feudalism there. And so I think it's the same thing. Now you have a weaponized dollar and a distrusted dollar and a dollar that was too strong. And I think that created a great deal of a great deal of, of ripple effects that were the opposite of what the U.S. policymakers intended, mm-hmm. sadly. Well, you know, Powell has been clear that he wants to break the Fed put mentality of the markets. Yet, you know, we're, we're near all time highs in most of these markets again. So is this really a time that the markets are just waiting for the Fed to come back in and, and create a tailwind for the markets? Well, it's a totally insane period. First of all, people are saying it's a bull market because we're up 20% year to date. Technically, we're not in a bull market. We're still in a bear market because the definition of a bear, you know, for a bull market, you have to beat prior highs, inflation adjusted prior highs. And we haven't done that yet. Mm-hmm. But there's no doubt that markets are ripping in 2023 compared to tanking in 2022. And you got to ask why. At the beginning of the year, everyone was expecting a Fed pivot because the yield curve said so, um, the, the, the euro dollar futures market said so, the market was pricing in a pivot. And so they were just expecting more liquidity. So they were buying in and, and that created a, a buy opportunity, a tail opportunity. So in a sense, bad news was good news, as always, in a Fed or a central bank led uh, economy and a central bank led stock market. Um, Powell, of course, only paused for a brief time and then it re- reheated again. So this idea of front running the Fed or playing the Fed, the real question is, it's very sad that the Fed is the market now. It is the market. What the Fed does or they project the Fed to do, you're arbitraging, you know, FOMC notes and, you know, uh, notes from the the Brookings Institute or notes from you know Jackson Hole. Everyone's trying to interpret what the Fed will do. That's where the market goes. And the idea was that this year would be a liquid year, a pivot year. It may still be if we have a market implosion. I think it's a dangerous way to play the market. If I actually thought the Fed was going to pivot, I'd wait for the market to tank first and then buy because the Fed will only pivot when the market tanks. But a lot of investors said, we're going to get liquidity this year. Powell's going to pivot. We're going to see QE coming out of QT. Let's get in now. I always say buy when there's a dip in a, in a market like that. If the Fed pivots, it'll only be when things are really ugly on, on, on Wall Street. So, mm-hmm. But I think, yeah, and again, to your point earlier, what are, what are the markets? What are the S&P? What is the NASDAQ? You know, it's a few big names. You've got a lot of zombie companies that used to rely on low rate you know, debt, low interest rates to extend and pretend to roll over their debt or to take out loans to buy their own shares to increase their profits and margins because CEOs are paid by share price. That game, that trick is slowly dying because Powell has raised rates. So you can give Powell credit for raising rates and, again, taking the punch bowl away from some of the old tricks on Wall Street. But he's still ultimately a central banker. He's a Fed chairman for a reason. They're groomed to take care of the markets. Um, And Powell is very, very much going to pivot if markets see a 30 40 percent drawdown, which is just a mean reversion. That could be I have no idea when or what event will trigger, but that's that's not unexpected. A 10% correction is nothing. That's normal for a normal market. So this Fed put, though, I think Powell has, you got to give him some credit. He did tighten more than anyone else, and he certainly raised faster than anyone else. But in doing so, as I said earlier, he's going to create more problems longer term than he's going to fix. Um, and the simple matter is he can't be Volcker when you have thirty, almost 33, 33 trillion in public debt. You can't raise rates that high without breaking the economy, breaking the banks, and breaking our budget, which is why we got downgraded by Fitch. But he ironically 
is going to make the cost of debt so high that the U.S. government's interest expense is going to be over a trillion dollars a year. They're going to have to print more money. That is inherently inflationary. That's the great irony. That's the thing I think people are missing. And that's that fiscal dominance argument that the St. Louis Fed came out with in June. It's important. It's important to think about that. You raise rates to fight inflation, but you make the cost of your debt, which is too big, too expensive, so you have to print more money to fix the debt. The Fed is trapped, like so many central banks. They're trapped. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, exactly to that point, Matt, you know, this, the second part of this year, we're going to see $1.85 trillion that the Treasury just announced that will be borrowing by the end of this year to help service, you know, spending, entitlements, and obviously, exactly, servicing interest on the debt. So does that, in a lot of ways, reverse the trend of a contraction in the money supply that we saw this this four percent year over year reduction in M two money mm -hmm. supply that, mm -hmm. as you have said previously, is is so indicative of a recession. Yeah, I mean, again, that's another sign of a recession. There's so many signs of a recession. Again, I think um, to your point, you know, that one point eight five trillion for the next six months again is is astounding. And and again, our, we're averaging about $5 trillion in spending a year. We're, we're increasing our deficits at a record pace. Again, that's part of the reason we got to downgrade. When Fitch downgraded us, they're basically saying the credit rating, the risk of default is higher in the U.S. government than it is at Johnson & Johnson or Microsoft. But again, the Fed won't default. But in terms of what that will mean for the money supply, um, right now, raising rates and tightening is, is definitely not helping the money supply. But if there is a crisis, and I think there will be a credit crisis based on that kind of debt level, because the only way to pay for that debt is either to run bigger deficits. But when those deficits cause something to crash, um, because we're having a credit contraction, and M2 is about credit, and it's about money, and it's about deposits, and about money in circulation. Right now, I think M2 could actually continue to go down as we keep raising rates and as we keep seeing bank contraction and, and lo negative loan growth in U.S. commercial banks. So the money supply is still, the M2 number is still under tremendous threat. I think the only thing that would really send the money to M2 supply back um, above its kind of trend line would be a massive liquidity event. Um, right now, I don't see the M2 data getting much better uh, in a high rate environment. And uh, it's a contraction, so it's a credit contracting environment, which again, ironically, is going to lead to more inflation. But it also, in the meantime, when you contract credit at these levels, banks are simply not going to lend as easily and as overtly and as generously as they did in the past. And again, who does that hit the most? Small businesses and those that can't roll over their debt. Um, and then in addition to this deficit spending, this, this $1.85 trillion, uh, again, I'm, I'm not going to take credit. Daniel Martina Booth was way ahead on the research on this. But you see these these tax credits going out for employee tax credits, twenty nine billion in one month, thirty three billion in another month. It's fraud. The IRS has warned against this, um, but that too is basically taxpayer expenses. That's also false liquidity. It's a fake way of recovering from some of the spending. And those same people are out in Rome and Paris right now on these tax credits, and they're going to get audited by the IRS. But I mean. It's fraud. It, it's it's fraud. These are all symptoms of what happens when there's too much debt. People are desperate. They're still trying to get handouts from the COVID rules. They're still trying to take tax credits. Well, most of those were done a year ago. But now, since it's reopened, it's a way to create more liquidity, fake liquidity that isn't directly QE, but it benefits another small minority of, of business owners who are probably going to get in big trouble for this, this fraud. We'll see. Well, Matt, you know, inflation is called an invisible tax, and, and certainly anybody that has paid attention to prices for nearly anything over the past three years has certainly noticed the cost of regular goods really skyrocket and the value of their currency not go as far. So what do you see as the trajectory for inflation here? Have high rates really broken the back of inflation? Or is that, you know, as we've as we've talked about, just uh, another another dip in this inflationary cycle? Yeah, again, I think it's like, you know, it's like surfers. There's seven sets to every wave. The seventh is always the biggest. Inflation is moving cycles. This, two points. First, I think the CPI, and this is not an apology or a, or a you know, a sensational gold bug argument. It's an open secret that the CPI scale is bogus. That's true. If, if they're saying 3%, it's at least 6%. Um, so first, you have to just, you have to, you have to look at the actual um, inflation scale and look at it with, with, uh, with eyebrows raised. Um, the second thing is, to my point, fiscal dominance. It is a cycle where we haven't, we can't claim Roma Victoria over inflation just because it's, it's a three percent today. 
um, we're taking a pause. It's a summer pause in the markets and liquidity and everything. But you're going with that kind of spending that you just alluded to and those types of gaps between the foreign buyers of our U.S. treasuries and our, you know, our growing deficit. We're going to go farther and farther into deficits, farther and farther into debt. And the interest expense on our current IOUs, which, by the way, 50% of those roll over in the next 12 to 24 months, they're going to get higher and higher. There is nobody to buy those bonds. There's nobody to buy those bonds unless we print more money. Now, you could argue that the Fed could declare an emergency and stop giving interest on excess reserves to the commercial banks or force JP Morgan and Bank of America to buy U.S. treasuries. It, it, it's, you know, there could be draconian measures like that. But short of even that, um, there's simply no way to live on a Ferrari appetite with a busboy salary with this much debt without coming up with, a, with more money. Now, a busboy with a Ferrari appetite gets his car taken away from him, but the United States government can call up the Eccles building and mouse click a couple zeros to solve that problem. So they can have a busboy salary and still drive a Ferrari because of the U.S. government. They can have legalized counterfeit and legalized uh, money expansion. But again, that solution, that mouse click money, that instant liquidity, which has got to come from somewhere and it's not coming from outside of the U.S., is going to have to come, in my opinion, from a money printer. To me, it's an it's un, unavoidable. Uh, short of, um, you know, GDP growth. How are you going to get GDP growth when you're in this much debt? We used to average since 1950 9%. Now we're at 2 percent because we have too much debt. Are you going to get it from tax receipts? Well, if the markets continue to break records, I guess you can get a little more tax receipts and capital gains. But that's not going to save America. That's not going to provide the liquidity for its saturated, its dried up, liquidity thirsty bond market. And um, to, the, to your point, I think those, those debt numbers, those spending numbers make synthetic liquidity and QE inevitable, which means inflation inevitable. Um, and you can have inflation, deflation cycles in gold, by the way, which is currency protection. It, it can go high or low in inflation or deflation. It can go high or low with low rates or high rates. It's not even just the gold price that I'm thinking about. I'm just looking at a debt end game that I wrote about the other day on this budget analysis, this last two, two trillion for the next six months. That's insane. People are losing their minds. Um, that's insane. That's not sensational. That's just basic math. That is not sustainable. I, I, I'd happily hear what other solution there is. I, if someone has a better solution, if that money's going to come from, from Santa Claus or from somewhere else, I, 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 I'm not even trying to be sarcastic. I'd like to yeah. know where it's going to come from. The only other thing I can think of is of they declare some kind of fiscal emergency and uh, you know, force banks to buy more treasuries and absorb that debt or stop giving them interest on excess reserves to save up some money. But um, or they do a great reset or they do a debt jubilee or they do another Bretton Woods 2.0. Something's going to break. Uh, and again, I have no idea when it's already broken, though, Tom. It's already broken. It, it, it's just, already broken. And we're just kind of it, I, I feel like we're in the fall and we're just ready to. We haven't hit the ground yet, maybe, right? Well, again, I, I was it's, just at this conference in Florida, in Palm Beach, you know, and for the wealthy, it's, yeah, it's okay, because that class of, of lords can handle it. It's the serfs that are going to suffer the most, but it, it is already broken. It reminds me of that cartoon where Wiley Coyote jumps off the cliff, and he's just flying in the air, and he hasn't fallen yet. Yeah. And that's where we are, and many of us, well, Matt, you've been saying that for years. Well, yeah, I have, but it's still going to fall. Gravity still works and debt still works. And even though the Fed can postpone the laws of gravity and debt for a period of time, they can't defy them. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you know, as, as you're saying, you know, we can't really ever declare victory on inflation. I think the only way we could is to actually start decreasing public debt, regardless of where actual inflation is at that point. And start paying down some of that debt, but we would need real growth to be able to make that happen. Yeah. Um, yeah. Matt, you know, when we talk about inflation, should we really be breaking it down into two parts that of money growth and the other side of it of consumer prices? When you talk about CPI inflation, I mean, to me, inflation is really the money supply and the power of the currency, the Milton Friedman model. I mean, we can look at the Bureau of Statistics and the CPI model, the one they used in the 80s and the 90s, the one they use now. We can break down energy costs, owner's equivalent rent. Um, I think, to me, inflation is very simple. Um, it's the debasement of the currency, and it's going to come from more created. As Larry Leopard said, he said it. I can't take credit for it. I, he said, you can't, you can't taper a Ponzi scheme. 
Mm-hmm. You can't taper a Ponzi scheme. And our government is effectively a Ponzi scheme. If if, if I've, I have joked that if 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 Bernie Madoff or your typical hedge fund manager over his skis and margin had a money printer, they would never go to jail. Bernie Madoff would still be in business because he could just legally print more money to continue the scam. Well, the U.S. government can do what Bernie Madoff couldn't do, but it can't taper. But it does have a money printer. And to me, that is where the inflation will come from. Um, and that is where the M2 rise will come from eventually. Um, right now, um, you know, the energy costs have been low this summer. The owner's equivalent rent manipulations have brought CPI down. Again, it's how those things are weighted. That's a conversation that would take too long and probably too much brain cells for me to answer today. But it's 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 a bogus scale. But the inflation won't come from the Bureau of Labor Statistics official number. It will come from synthetic liquidity, which will be inevitable to monetize a debt that we cannot sustain naturally. The other, to your point, yes, if we could get more growth and cut spending, uh, that could be helpful. Um, But I think we've talked about this in the past. um, A a politician that's going to try to run for election by saying to the public, look, we're too much in debt. We're going to need austerity. We're going to need higher taxes. Uh, not just the rich, but the middle class. We're going to have to bring manufacturing back to the U.S., and we're going to have to suffer a period of a strong, long recession, and we're going to have to reset everything. And there's going to be a lot of pain. They probably wouldn't get elected, mm-hmm. sadly. Um, maybe if they were truly eloquent and, and honest, they could. But what we really need is the opposite of what we have. We've gone from being the world's greatest manufacturer and creditor to the world's biggest outsourcer and debtor. As I've said many times, the American dream is made in China now. That was because American CEOs wanted cheaper labor and cheaper, you know, you know, basically better margins, better, better top and bottom line for themselves at the expense of American workforce. But, you know, we need to bring manufacturing back to the U.S. GDP. We have to produce things in the U.S. Um, and we have to cut our spending. But there's already fixed costs that even, even if we cut future spending, there are fixed costs on the entitlement side that we just don't have the money for without printing more. I think we're, we're again, we're that cartoon character that's already over the cliff. Um, I think we're gonna have to go through a lot of mess before it gets better. I think there'll be no central bankers or politicians will take any accountability for that mess and they will blame it on something. They'll blame it on the climate, they'll blame it on COVID, they'll blame it on Putin, but all of these problems existed before any of those three became the headline du jour. Mm-hmm. You know, Matt, trying to get a clearer picture as well on one of the most heavily relied upon metrics for the Fed has been the the labor market stats. So if we separate growth in different job sectors, does this actually paint a far different picture as well than that that is being told in the media? Well, this too, again, it's like I I look at labor statistics like I look at inflation statistics and maybe it just sounds like, you know, I'm just a permable, a perma bear and just whining and whining about the Bureau of Labor Statistics or these these dated, these fiction writers in D.C. Um, You know, you've got initial jobless claims skyrocketing right now. You've got delinquencies. You've got people who can't make credit cards and car payments. Um, Is that because they're fully employed and doing great? Um, you've got layoffs in tech. You've got layoffs coming out of COVID because they overhired in tech. Now they're laying them off. You've got higher bankruptcy filings. Those companies that are filing for bankruptcy must be laying people off. So these these data points right now haven't got, they're kind of lagging. They haven't come into the official U6, U3 unemployment. But again, again, it would take a separate episode to go into all the U3 and U6 unemployment data that the Bureau of Labor Statistics uses. And Nick Eberstadt, does a great job of discussing this better than me. What I am saying globally is the labor is the one thing that hasn't cracked yet. But in my opinion, that labor data is specious and totally disingenuous. It doesn't mean we have 30% unemployment. But what Nick Eberstadt and others have have shown, and as I've written about even years ago, is that that what what the Bureau of Labor Statistics uses to measure the employment pool, it, it ignores tens of millions of people who just stopped looking for jobs. The the the, unemplo- the the employment numbers also include second and third jobs. So it's one person with two or three jobs. It's a lot of distortion in this, but the bottom line is it's like measuring, well, we don't have a lot of short people anymore, but the only labor pool or the only pool you're using is to measure is the NBA because there's not many short people in the NBA. And there's, there's really not a lot of unemployed people because we're only looking at the people that are employed because they're ignoring a whole segment of the of the available labor force that isn't part of the statistics. Again, I'm not saying we're seeing depression bread lines like the 1930s yet, or even will. I'm saying the U3 and U6 unemployment data 
is as bogus to me as the as the as the uh, CPI data. And many will say that's just Matt being a perma bear. But I, I I invite people to look at articles I've written on the unemployment lie years ago, but also to look at Nick Eberstadt's data and to frankly look at the current data, the current bankruptcies, the current filings, the current layoffs that happened at the end of last year and coming into this year, which haven't made the Bureau of Labor Statistics official employment data. I'm not saying we're in recessionary unemployment levels yet, um, but we're certainly much higher unemployment that's reported out of D.C. Like so much out of D.C., again, sounds like I'm a revolutionary, a perma bear. It's just not true. To Bob Morita's point, it's just not true. Things just aren't what they seem. You know, Matt, on the on the idea of you know not being sensational, something we touched on a couple times a little bit here is the idea of the BRICS summit here on August twenty second coming up in a couple of weeks being yeah. this this sea change event for the dollar. Yeah, we we've talked about it a, a good amount on the program here. What is your understanding of it, and, and do you think it is going to be this this immediate change in the dollar? Yeah, I think, look, as you and I talked about before this, there's, there's plenty of sensational reality that I don't think we need to hype up the BRICS summit. First of all, I don't think we, anyone really knows. Coming into this symposium in Florida, there was so much clickbait about the end of the dollar or the dethroning of the dollar or this gold back currency or this gold back trading currency, because there's a big difference. Um, and I can't add more than your other guests have probably already said. There's a few simple things. First of all, the BRICS organizers have said it's not on the agenda. Now, the Russian state media says it is, and there was a leak from a um, uh, there was a there was a leak from a, a Kenyan or Russian embassy in Kenya about this happening in August, and it's going to happen. And, and I, I certainly don't know, but I think the very first threshold question is it even on the agenda? That's the first thing. Um, so we don't need to get all hyped about that. Um, but I think there's already enough evidence of something sensational in de-dollarization. The BRICS summit isn't the most important thing if they have a gold-backed trading currency announced on August 24th. What you're certainly seeing with the BRICS, no matter what, is the world, especially the developing economies and large com- countries, and now Saudi Arabia in the mix is very important, there's no doubt that there are 41 countries now in bilateral trade agreements outside of the U.S. dollar. There's no doubt that the, Europe, that the Eurasian Economic Union, which Glasiev has helped create a settlement agreement outside the U.S. dollar, is going to spread into the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. So there's no doubt that large swaths of the world are already looking outside of the U.S. dollar. Regardless of whether we have a gold-backed trading currency announced anytime soon, there is enough real headlines right now to make the BRICS conference less of a sensational issue and more of we should be focused on what we already know. Now, will the BRICS eventually get to a, a gold backed trading currency? Even the Russian central bank said that will take time. That will take time. I don't think, in my opinion, it's going to happen by August 24th. Could be wrong. Doesn't matter to me, though, because what's already happening to the U.S. dollar is, 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 is scary enough. But even that, I got to take the, the Brent Johnson's point, too, though. The dollar, as I said, isn't isn't going to die easily, even if all these companies, excuse me, all these countries come together and they all try to find more and more ways to trade outside of the dollar, and come up with an independent issuing bank that eventually has a gold backed currency. That will certainly, I mean, the the, the world's reserve of the FX reserves, uh, you know, I think for have fallen from seventy three percent to fifty eight percent. De dollarization is already in process. There is less demand for the dollar. That's already real. But you have to keep in mind also there's $30 trillion outside of the U.S. that are held in checking accounts and U.S. Treasury accounts and also in U.S. stock accounts that are held by people outside, even if they don't like America, don't want to see the dollar end overnight. And to Brent Johnson's point, the, 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 the U.S. Treasury is collateral for massive amounts of, of derivative trades and, and leverage trades in the euro banking system, the euro dollar system. That's not going to die overnight either. So the dollar is not going to disappear this year or next summer. But to the flip side to that, the fact that right after that uh, BRICS announcement made the headlines, the fact that you know Yellen was on, on her way to China, got nothing resolved, but they did send Yellen to China. They're, they're, they're nervous. And they even had to send Kissinger, it's like 100 years old, out to China. There's, they're nervous. The trend is obvious away from the dollar. It's just the magnitude that is, I think, overhyped. I think there's no doubt the U.S. hegemony is over for the dollar. But I don't think the U.S. dollar supremacy is over, to Rick Rule's point. The dollar isn't going to disappear anytime soon. Doesn't matter to me as a gold investor because ultimately the dollar gets less and less purchasing power. 
But I think it is a seismic shift. And again, we could spend another hour just on what's happening with Saudi Arabia, where, where the real power could be is if Saudi Arabia really rethinks the uh, the petrodollar system. Because, you know, Saudi Arabia is coming further and further away from Biden and the fist pump to a more of a handshake with Xi. There's more reasons for Saudi Arabia to be aligned with China and Russia than there are with Biden. The U.S. dollar and U.S. Treasury isn't what it was when Kissinger was running around OPEC countries in the 70s, as opposed to what's happening now. It's pathetic, actually. Uh, it's The dollar isn't the same. The U.S. Treasury isn't the same. The, the, gold, the, the, the dollar-backed petrol trade, petrol trade isn't the same. That could be another headline, like the Japanese carry trade, that we just don't see coming. But to your question, I don't know what's going to happen with the BRICS. I don't think it's going to be a gold-backed trading currency announced on the 24th. Could be totally wrong. It doesn't even matter because there's so much already happening among the BRICS nations, the SCO nations, the Euro Eurasian economic um, trade settlement discussions, what Glassiev wants to do with the Moscow world standard. This process is slow, not overnight. And I think it's wrong for our industry to kind of hype this up too much because it's already sensational enough. It's just not going to happen in 24 hours. Yeah, thank, thank you for that, Matt, because it's, I, I think you put that perfectly that there, there can be a lot of clickbaity, you know, pieces written about this, and I do think it is, it is going to take time. And you know, yeah. to that point, you, you started a recent article with a Rudyard Kipling line from one of his most famous poems. So, yeah. if you could tell us what that is, because I think that really applies perfectly here. Well, it's a beautiful. It's the first line of a poem written in eighteen ninety five, I think. Um, and it was, if you can keep your head about you, well, all about you are losing theirs. And then it goes on. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a letter from a father to a son. If, 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 if you do these things, then you'll be a man. And I was using that line only because it's hard to keep our head about us when everyone else is losing theirs. This goes back to our original comment, the centralization, the dishonesty, the, the malfeasance, the negligence. Um, the self-interestedness, the the uh, disingenuous policies, the centralization of our government, the centralization of our finances, people are losing their heads. They're deliberately losing their heads, but they're ignoring the vast swath of, of, the, of the world. I think for those of us that are getting more and more informed and looking at spreads and looking at currencies and looking at global politics and looking at the weaponization of the world reserve currency and looking at the debt levels of the U.S. and the amount of synthetic liquidity it requires to sustain those. It's so crazy you could lose your head. So you have to keep your head while all these policy policymakers and decision makers are, are losing theirs. And that's a challenge for those of us who aren't just perma bears or sensationalists or clickbaiters or hypesters. The sober reality is bad enough without saying there's a gold back currency in August in South Africa. We don't need that. There's already enough sober reality to be very alarmed. And as I've said year after year, and it's it's never gonna change, the debt market is the thing, the bond market is the thing. We have historically unprecedented debt levels and not enough liquidity naturally to pay for them. There will be consequences, the most dangerous of which, and I'll repeat it over and over, every time throughout history when you have a debt crisis, it leads to a currency crisis, which leads to social unrest, which leads to more extreme control from the political left or right. That is throughout history. I can give mm -hmm. five examples right now, but that is, un that is, there's no exception. And what we are seeing right now, don't have to predict it for August 24th or for clickbait. We're already seeing it right now with the weaponization of our Department of Justice, with the weaponization of our media, with the weaponization of our currency, uh, with the weaponization of science, with the CBDs DC, with FedNow, with WorldCoin. We're seeing so many examples of this right now. And, and to my point earlier, let's hope better minds prevail. Those of us who keep our heads, the Russell Brands, your platform, others, the Robert Kennedys, whatever your view, get more honest people, get people more informed, You know, then we can keep our heads and not lose our heads because it seems like the rest of the, the world is losing its head. Mm -hmm. you know, figuratively. Well, Matt, I think that's a good place to wrap up for today. Thank you for helping us and all of our listeners keep our heads here. My we can, pleasure. We can, we can find more of your articles that we talked about as well as your interviews at goldswitzerland.com. Anywhere else you'd like to point to? No, that's where we're found. And uh, Egon von Greyers and myself are usually at least have an article out every week. And um, uh, 
it's not always just precious metals focused because precious metals follow the macros. So we're looking at the macros very carefully. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, Matt, thanks for another excellent, excellent conversation as always. Appreciate it. My pleasure. My pleasure, Tom.